Always happy to be here with you as we are here with, for the first time ever, TJ Conley. But Danny Conley, we've done a lot of these together. Yeah. We have the opportunity to do it once again, but it's a father and son duo tonight, so welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Danny, did you prep him at all? Did you let him know what to expect from me? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah I, I told him just to look at you and uh, look at me and have fun and yeah. answer the questions. He's a good guy, you know. So we're here at the Wildcat Sports Club, 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York. Happy to be here with you, as we are here every single month with Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, and always about the community. TJ, you're over with the FM Hornets, and you have had yourself somewhat of a career that will obviously lead you into collegiate lacrosse. So let's get into that, and first and foremost, from the FM world, just what you've taken away from being a Hornet. Probably the biggest thing is uh, the team aspect. Uh, in football, I know our coaches stress being together in the in the summer, so it's getting one of the guys in the summer, getting run hills, getting away from them, so definitely being the guys in the summer. Who are some of the guys on the team that you've had the most time spent with? Uh, lifelong friend, Chris Holcraft. Um, he just finished his baseball season. Um, James Mason. I'm getting closer to being with Ty. They can play pop one just because they're so big, but Danny, for you, not your only child, and we'll right. we'll talk about some questions that TJ has for you about that. But sure. bring me into what it's like to see. I mean, you went through the recruiting process, right. and you know what it's like to you know see that as a dad, and now you get to continue that with TJ. Just what that's been like for you to go through it with him personally. It's, uh, you know, we went through it with my, uh, my older son, Zach, who's at Binghamton right now. And uh, so, you know, that, that was an experience. But I tell you, the, uh, the world of lacrosse recruiting is it's much different than football. You know, with all the travel of lacrosse that's going on, you've got so many, you know, especially in this area, you've got so many really qualified coaches that are teaching these guys not only how to play the game, you know, scheme-wise, but technique-wise. And uh, they put together some really strong teams. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, you know, I was, I was down with Rick Beardsley down in uh, the, the Hill School once down in Pennsylvania. And, you know, we, uh, he introduced me to, you know, I think it's Tilly down at Maryland. And he's like, I remember watching you play when I was over at Cornell or Ithaca. And, uh, you know, that was pretty cool. But, you know, they get an opportunity, the, the, uh, the lacrosse coaches get an opportunity to go out to these, these, um, these tournaments like the NXT down in Philly, I mean, they get to evaluate 100 kids over a weekend, you know. So I think, you know, I really, and, and they, they extend offers out way earlier, like, uh, you know, if you're not accepting a scholarship offer, to, I think Christmas of your junior year, you're going to miss out on the money in lacrosse. So they do a great job of evaluating the kids. You know, football, I think, is behind the eight ball a little bit. They don't get out, they don't. They're not able to see as many kids as lacrosse coaches are. So I do, and I'll tell you, you know, TJ has been committed to Rutgers uh, for lacrosse. Um, I've never seen a program. Uh, he gets a, he gets a red envelope every day in the mail, and every third day it's a handwritten letter. And uh, they've just done a great job recruiting him. And you know, I uh, I wasn't a big fan of Rutgers when I was coaching at Syracuse until I saw them embrace my son and my family, and uh, we've just bought in. And, that, that's what I've seen is from a recruiting aspect of athletics these days. I just I think, well, I believe that you know lacrosse is much further ahead than football these days. And, you know, and, and you you speak on that, and obviously the the world of lacrosse and getting out there and, and getting after it, and the importance of of just getting in the car and driving, right, and, and that face to face interaction, as well as the fact you talked about the letters that. There's a red letter every day, and then the third day there's a red letter. TJ, what does that mean to you that, you know, you said yes to Rutgers, so sometimes when you say yes to a team, they go, okay, on to the next one. But they're recruiting you after they recruited you, and after the commitment, 
they're making sure that you know that you're still appreciated. Not every school does that, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like when, when people start, you know, you ask somebody out, right? You might write them a letter, do something nice for them. And then after you do that, you might write them a letter the first year. You might do something really nice for Valentine's Day, but then you stop writing letters. You stop sending a rose. Rutgers is courting you even after you said yes. What does that mean to you? Uh, it means a lot. I mean, I know they're in the middle of their season. They're still reaching out to me. They're asking all my football season's down. Uh, support me through football. Um, so I, I know it means a lot. I know it takes time and effort uh, to send out letters and handwrite them. So it means a lot to me. Today. When you get those handwritten letters, that to me in and of itself, because there's nothing better than a pen and a pad and everything that I do from sports casting to screenwriting stuff to I've been I've written songs you know growing up like written 40 songs at this point I'm thinking of that but I I do a lot of different things when it comes to a pen and a pad I will never stop appreciating that when you get a handwritten I just got one from the Missouri Valley Football Conference because we did a show together and it was a simple note but it said from the commissioner Dan great to spend some time with you I appreciated that and I read it to my fiance and I was like that was so nice, and it was written, you know, from the commissioner herself. So when you get a handwritten letter, what does that do for you? Especially in a world that you live in, where I'm surprised you know what handwritten letters are. Yeah, I appreciate um, that. I take them all. I, I, I put up the love, and I've definitely kept all of them. So um, the first one was definitely really cool to see. So that was definitely really cool. He sent something every couple of weeks, so it's pretty cool. Do you remember what, what did the first one say that stuck out to you? Um, just talking about how he wants me to get down there, wants my family to get down there, wants us to be a part of the Rutgers community. Being a part of the Rutgers community, Danny, you talked about, and it's a normal thing that if you're connected to Syracuse, if you grew up in Syracuse, if you sure. played for Syracuse, Rutgers is a hard thing to stomach. So, sure. <laughs> how did they woo you while they were taken care of, obviously, <clears throat> recruiting a TJ? When I, was, uh, when I was coaching at Syracuse, uh, I, I'm not sure that we had any uh, red colored clothing in anybody, anyone's wardrobe, just because, you know, you had Shiano coaching uh, down at Rutgers, and, you know, the, uh, the recruiting wars, the, war, the wards that are sad, and, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm an orangeman through and through, and, you know, that's, I'll always be that. And uh, so, you know, that was the school that kind of picked a scab that really just got, it kind of irritated me. So, you know, and then, you know, as, as my career, you know, finished, um, to watch my, 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 uh, my kids kind of embrace, you know, not only football, but the cross was, was very cool. Um, I remember my wife saying, yeah, you know, uh, you know Rutgers is a school that's really interested in TJ. We're going to take a trip down. And I'm like, oh, here we go, Rutgers, right? And... Um, what sold me was I, uh, I. We all went down as a family to uh, the Rutgers Harvard game uh, in, in the playoffs, and there was a buddy of mine that had a tailgate. We got out of the car, and my buddy Dan back down there. He's like, "Your son's better looking than you. I know he's smarter than you." He goes, "I'm going to take him to the shore. He's never coming back to Syracuse," and uh, they embraced him right out of the car. And to see these. You know, it's been a long time since we've had success at Syracuse, which that's just fact, right? So to see these guys just get excited, the, the fans and the players get excited about athletics again was awesome to experience. And then we walked into the stadium, TJ makes eye contact with Eric Sermon, I believe his last name is. He stops coaching pregame, comes in the stands, gives my wife a hug, gives him, punches him, and then shakes my hand, it's a fr and I'm like, I thought he was recruiting me. And it was, um, you know, the handwritten letters, it's like, I get chills even thinking about it. It's, they've created it, and Brian, it's part of Brian Breck's uh, recruiting philosophy is, you know, I, I, you know, TJ's met people and they've talked about, you know, we do all our stuff digitally, and, and, and Eric told us, he goes, it's really important that we handwrite our players so they really understand how committed we are to them and how special this is. And they do have something very special going on down there. So I'm sold. I actually am owner of Rutgers T-shirt, so. What do you think about that? So your dad not only has red, but has Rutgers Scarlet Night Red. Yeah, big turn. Um, 
it just shows his supportiveness. He's always been supportive of us, whether we want to go play in a musical, he'd show up to other concerts. So he's always been supportive of us. He hasn't pushed us to do anything we don't want to do. So. You hear him talk about his history with Rutgers. Do you guys go back and forth playfully with that or not? Uh, not really, no. <laughs> I can tell you in the beginning of my process, I ruled out Rutgers pretty early often. I was like, nope, not going there. I don't want to grow up in New Jersey. And then I actually got to meet him, got to go there, and uh, ended up being the best decision I made. What was it about being on campus itself? Because you said, I don't want to grow up in New Jersey. Going there and experiencing the campus, what were the things that stick out the most that made you say, you know what, I gotta, I gotta give this another look? Yeah, uh, it's a big campus. I mean, my big thing was I wanted to go to a big school. I wanted to go to other events, go to basketball games, go to football games. Um, so then, and then the tournament they use is they, they have that deer crossing their campus. So it's not right in the city, but it's, um, they've got like a big college center. Uh, so it's not in the city. And the Prudential Center is right there. We talked about off the air. Beautiful place. Really awesome experience. And I mean, you know, you'll you'll see different teams that'll be in their seat halls, been in there before. And obviously, the New Jersey Devils and whatnot. So you get to have like that city aspect of it. You're not that far away from New York City as well, if you want to go that route. But you also can experience, like you said, having something that's a little bit away from that, right? So how would you describe the campus? I mean, they say they have deer crossing. If you are in Central and Upstate New York, there's deer everywhere. So is it really, does it feel like you're away from it all, or do you still feel like you're in a city? How does it, how does it feel? Um, I'd probably go in between. Okay. Uh, they've got like this own separate town called the College Center, and it's, it's really, really like, it's really in the city. Yeah. Um, and then the new complex they have is, uh, it's all by itself, very rough. Did the, did the facilities have something to do with your recruitment? You hear some people talk about facilities and upgrades and whatnot. Some don't care. Yeah. Did you care? Um, not as much. Uh, more more of the people, but the new locker room and the new facility yeah, is definitely pretty cool. I have to jump in here for a second. So way back in the day when I was playing at Main Fieldhouse, we used to have like a shower stall with six pickets around it where six guys would shower at once. These guys now have their own showers with frosted glass doors and like they got a they got a they got a really cool uh, uh, weight room and, and locker room. So uh, they just you know they blew, they blew me out of the water years ago when I took my oldest son Zach down there for the cross camp. And uh, believe it or not, TJ's first experience. Uh, I was coaching at Wagner College and my wife was working in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. And uh, we would spend the summers down at the Jersey Beach. And I turned my back on the ocean, and which you never do. I get hit by a wave, and TJ, a baby, gets thrown out of my arms. He's underwater. I pop up, he's gone. And a second later, he pops right back out of the water. And so he's got he's got Jersey water and Jersey ocean water and from, from the get-go. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, it's, it's it, you know, you know, you know, we joke about you know. I don't want to go to New Jersey. We, we never experienced New Jersey. Yeah, you know, we we're, we we have spent some time, my wife and I, in Staten Island, which we love, New York City. Uh, but um, even when I went down there, it's uh, the setting, the, the athletic environment down there uh, was really it was beautiful. And yeah. the, the college, like you said, it's a college town. It's very cool. And, to my disliking, a long time ago, when I when I took Zach down, I was like, oh, this place is kind of nice. You know? Yeah. Well, the thing is, going off of that story, you can say something that at least two members of the show can't say. Sammy and Ron didn't, but you survived the Jersey Shore. Yeah. Uh, that same day. I, I've never watched. Is that a TV show? Yeah, you don't need to watch it. That's fine. You don't need to. What do you think? Jersey Shore. No, we don't watch Yeah, no. They say that they're Italian, and I can tell you as I'm Italian and Hispanic. Being Italian, we're, none of us are colored orange. None of <laughs> us. And the sun is what we rely to give us our tan. Not, not anything sprayed, not, a, not anything that's artificial. We don't get in coffins. So the fact that they were all orange and tanned every day in and of itself shows you that they're not true. But don't ever watch the show. But if you tell somebody who did watch the show that you survived the Jersey Shore more than Ron and Sam, they'll get a kick out of that. Because they were, they were not a great. Not a great group. But going back after 
somehow miraculously popping up in the water there. Do you plan on going back to the show? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's right there. Um, we've got a couple kids, a couple of recruits that actually live in New Jersey, so they definitely know the area pretty well. I'll, I'll, I'll be asking them. Yeah, Wildwood, if you go on the, uh, you go on the, what is it called? The, the boardwalk, and you can enjoy. I did, so I, somebody signed me up for this and forged my signature. So I did the extreme pass or whatever it's called. So I was on a bungee. You have to literally sign your life away and all these things. Like if you die, like you admit it. Like it's okay. You have to tell them if I die on this ride, I went on it willingly. So it's not your fault. It's still their fault. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and so I, I went on the bungee, which you feel like you're actually flying like an angel. It was actually really cool. That was the most fun, probably the most dangerous. Then I went on the slingshot thing that shoots you up in the air. And then I went on one that just swings you really high. So I would tell you, don't ever play the claw, the claw game to like grab an iPhone or something. Don't waste your money on that because I've actually grabbed it, and dropped it, and spent way too much money. But the actual like experiencing of the shore, the weirdest thing about it is Florida is my second home. And I got a bunch of family down there. I saw more dolphins in one day at Wildwood than I saw in every time I've been to Florida combined. So it's crazy, they have these like watch boats and so the boat will go by and they're pretty close inland and the boat will go by and there's three or four dolphins trailing it. So you'll have fun there. You definitely will have fun. There's a lot of people. The, the food's okay. Food's all right. Yeah, I'm all good stuff. So. Yeah, no, it'll be fun, it'll be good. Our, now that you know that this is like tangible, this is real, it's on its way, what do you do between now and then are you one of those people, do you get antsy? Do you get like excited, like you can't sit still? Or are you kind of calm, cool and collected and say, hey, you know what, when it's happening, it's gonna happen? Are you, are you anxious to get there now? Uh, I've, always, I've always taken a calm, cool, collective route. Um, and then just this summer, I'll, I'm just gonna be working all the time. So working to, to chase my goals. I still have goals, so working to achieve those. And, what are your goals, what do you have? Um, we got this camp in October, so I uh, definitely want to be one of the best ones there. So I'm going to be working with my brother, brother and his friends all, all year. So. All right. I'll tell you this. We, um, ironically enough, right before COVID hit, I, mean, I think I had COVID in January 2020, but, you know, kind of hit the area back in February, March. I, my wife and I had just spent some money on um, some weight equipment down in the basement, like real deal. Olympic weights, 45 pound plates, probably 315 pounds worth of weights. I I spent a week with TJ just showing him some exercises, and um, that's the last time I lifted with him. And he's just embraced that. And uh, the the young guy daughter that I think his name is from Syracuse, a lacrosse player, it is a very good lacrosse player and a, and a really good athlete. And, and TJ had shown me some of the training videos that he did with some of those little jump cuts, we'd call them in football, and how explosive he is in and out of his cuts. And, you know, I, you know, I called my buddy Hal Luther from the Bills. I said, hey, I said, you know, because with Zach, my son Zach, 6'5", and, and, you know, everybody would say, well, you know, he just got to learn how to bend his knees and hips. And I was trying to figure this out. I'm like, I wonder why he doesn't bend his knees and hips. And then, so I went back and I coached Pop Warner so after Syracuse, I went down there and started coaching these guys in Pop Warner football. But when you get a heavier kid in Pop Warner football, they usually go flat-handed in a three-point stance because they're not strong enough to support themselves. So then I start looking, and, I'm, and I start asking the coaches, I said, well, what drills are you teaching these guys to, to bend at the knees and the hips and create these power angles? And they're kind of like staring right through me. And I go, okay, so I'm going to figure this out. And I, then I realize, I said, it really comes down to being strong enough to support yourself. So that's when I got Zach. I called Hal Luke and I said, are you still training guys to deep squat, top of the thigh, parallel to the, to the ground? He's like, yeah, absolutely. So that's when I showed TJ. He, he parallel squats 405. I mean, there's a reason. His core, his lower body, his hips, to his legs, very strong. Um, you know, he's, he's close to a 300 pound bench as a junior, and a 405 squat, a parallel squat which is a real squat, it's not like a box squat. So, by the way, I want to give a shout out to the Baldwinsville lacrosse teams. What an awesome season they had um, in the uh, FM girls uh, lacrosse team. They uh, made it to semifinals. It, just, it was great to see section three teams do so well this year. So, 
Um, but yeah, you know, if it's something, you know, he's, he's, you know, as far as developing himself, you know, setting goals for himself, I think that's an area that he continues to build upon is just developing himself. And a buddy of mine who used to be the strength coach up at Syracuse, we're going to meet with this week and talk about, I, I, you'll laugh at this, but we got a kitten and I use a little laser beam, probably not good for their eyes, but I said, TJ, watch this, and don't say anything. And I just play with the laser beam and the cat's, so when a cat starts going back and forth, it starts to drop in lower center of gravity. It's like a pencil. You know, if you're, if you're vertical, you, you, don't, you don't change direction really well, but if you drop like a Doug Hogue and it needs a hips, that's when you can get in and out of cuts and you don't circle the wagon, you know what I mean? So I showed TJ that, and so we're gonna go meet with my buddy Will here in a, in a week and, uh, and just continue to help him. And, and you know what, he'll see it once and it'll be the last time, and he'll do it on his own. Yeah, so going to see Coach Hicks. I oh, am. Yeah. yeah. So Coach Hicks, an, an amazing. Have you gotten to know Coach Hicks? No. Yeah. So this is going to be an experience for you. One of the kindest people. Never has lost his Carolinian accent. Yeah. So it's it's still very much there, but uh, extremely extremely great person, and he has been he single handedly was the bridge from Syracuse to the NFL. I mean, if there's anybody that could teach you anything about strength and conditioning. Coach Hicks is going to get you there. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the, the, guy from, the guy from Buffalo, Hal Luther, would swear yeah, Hal too, yeah. you know, Hal grew up under, uh, under Will Hicks at NC State. So, um, you know, Hal's great. I mean, Hal's been around forever and a day. He's just a fantastic. Yeah, great. And he, he stuck on from Syracuse to the Bills. He's the one that stayed there when Doug had moved on. And, and, so, yeah. and Hal's had opportunities to go elsewhere as that guy. He just... You know when you know when when you when, when you get old enough and you, you understand the value of good people. Yeah. It, it far outweighs the green of grass that we all see right in front of us, seeing dollar figures. He knows he's in a great place right now, and uh, so he's he's planting his feet in Buffalo. Will's here and uh, still loves training kids, and he's uh, you know he and I go back a long way back to the uh, accident I used to have here. And the, yellow jeep with the rag cap, the rag top off so yeah i'm looking forward for these guys to get together and you know tj you know i, I never even talked to him about running a 40 and last summer he went to the, the university of buffalo football camp and ran four five nine four six one electronic time on field turf to compare doug hope ran four six five at the nfl combine yeah. doug hope could flat out fly so without any training or technique, you were in four five nine four six one as a sixteen year old kid. So he's he's got some very explosive body movements and he can go. So um, the the future's going to be bright for him. You talk, you know, hear Dad talk so highly of you. How do you take that academics? <laughs> like a ninety three GPA too. Well, that so when you look at that, right? Where does where does all of this come from? I mean, being raised right obviously has a place in it, right? You know, my parents always cared about the things that, that at 36 years old, I still care about them, right? It was always God first, it was be responsible, do your work, have morals and values, help out other people, don't expect anything in return, know who you are, be who you are, be proud of who you are, and everything that I learned as a kid stays with me today. Because I said it today on the show, in the morning, I said, as a business owner, as a broadcaster, some broadcasters go and do their show, right? They go on the air 9 to 11 like I would, and then after that, somebody else sells their show. So they have people out there selling spots on the show, somebody produces the show, someone hands them statistics, does all the research, watches the game for them, puts them in a car, drives them to places. I do all that myself. But some people only have to work two hours a day and then they can go eat Cheerios. And they say, well, what stops you? I said, me. And hearing your dad talk, you sound like the person that stops you from being lazy. Yeah. Why do you have this, like, being who you are, being a kid, your kid, why are you so responsible? And why don't you slack off? Um, I think I just want to be great. And um, but the big thing I say to myself is I'm really satisfied. So. I've got the 405 squat, but I've got the video we failed 425. So I just keep looking at 425, 425, 425. I keep seeing myself fail that, so that's the next goal. What is it about school that you enjoy? And I'm going to second with this. Favorite subject, least favorite subject? Um, I can go favorite subject, history. Um, okay. I find that interesting. Least favorite, science. 
I feel like I got asked this question last week, and I said history, social studies, and I would probably pick science as my least favorite yeah. science. I, earth science? I, I, did you have to take earth science? I took that eighth grade. Yeah, me too. I can tell you this to this day. I've been outside a lot. I've camped. Yeah. I've gone, you know, caught wildlife, and we used to like bring like salamanders and tadpoles or whatever, and newts and whatnot, and build them habitats. So we knew all about different things going on. If you put, still to this day, Mr. Schnipp, God bless your heart, if you put three rocks in front of me, they were the same. Yeah. And they would, he would say, tell me the 12 things different. And I would say, this one doesn't shine in the light like that one does. That one's gray, that one's gray, that one's gray. And I'm like, well, if I break it open, is there something? Yeah. And there's people just right in a way, to this day, couldn't tell you the difference. Yeah. Three rocks. Three gray rocks. Yeah, I mean, I'm taking physics and they introduced a bunch of equations and took it on a math class. It's like, I might, I might even take it on. Take? So I took intro to astronomy, not knowing that it was physics related. I took it because I wanted to learn. I had to take science in, in college and I had to take two. So I took one over the summer so I could do it online because I had no desire to have to take one and sit in the classroom. And then I took intro to astronomy and my teacher's phenomenal. Yeah. And just a really, really happy guy and he made you want to learn, and he looks like Will Ferrell with, yeah. with glasses on. So I loved it, but it was <laughs> physics. Yeah. And because going out to space is so far, they created the astronomical unit, which like one AU is this many miles, and they had to create new math just to describe the physics of space. Yeah. I could tell you I passed the class, I don't know how, but I loved learning about it, and I can look up at the sky, and still to this day tell you stuff, yeah. But please don't ask me like what an astronomical unit is because I don't know. I'll share a little bit of my college experience with you. So I, I was doing a little, <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. I was here like six years and I would have stayed long but they stopped paying for it. I was going to say, did you get a doctorate? <laughs> I, uh, I was doing the, the color for the Patriot League a couple of years ago uh, and yeah. Harvard was playing Lafayette and it was like 55 to nothing. In I the just talked quarter. to the commissioner, Jennifer Heppel of the Patriot League. Yeah. Well, apparently I did well because I wasn't invited back. <laughs> I did have one guy in uh, Holy Cross that I should just go straight to the NFL. Um, <clears throat> but one of the uh, tight ends, his, his last name was like Ron Kaus. They called him Ron, like Ron. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm reading through the, we used to have like cheat cards in front of us. And it, I'm like, yeah, this tight end, Ron Kaus, he looks like he's majoring in mm, molecular, molecular biological. I'm pretty sure I majored in that in Syracuse. And the guy's like, I'm pretty sure you did. I go, I'm pretty sure I did. So that was my Syracuse education. I was going to say, did you did you have a favorite subject and a least favorite thing? Well, you know what? Believe it or not, I carried a 3 0 in my major. I was an interior design major at Syracuse. Have you put that, has he put that to use at home? No. 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 Do you, does he get to choose anything on the walls, pillows, anything? Okay. Yeah, a little bit. I, I enjoy that. You know, yeah. it's, it's a little bit being creative. It's like cutting grass. You know, putting perfect lines in. I was the first guy to put circles in in Rodax front front uh, lawn in Malloy Road. Uh, I will tell you that. So. I'll tell you what. That's that's something that they don't do today. Wow. Football players. So when I was coaching at Syracuse, when when Greg Robinson hired me. We basically put all the kids up at Skytop. They all took one class. They got two hundred dollars a week, you know. So they're, you know, the, the bad thing was those places weren't air conditioned. So they're playing video games and sleeping all day. So back in 1989, when I went to Syracuse, sorry, this is not all about I.I.I., but I got a six-dollar job working with Sedgwick Construction, pushing a lawnmower for eight hours a day. Every once in a while, they'd let me sit on a tractor, but mostly I weed whack and push the lawnmower. Then go home, eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, then go down and work out with a guy like Will Hicks for another two hours on lifting weights. So when you got into the fourth quarter and other teams were kind of like dragging and we're playing in a dome, that's where you reach down inside and you find that extra whatever it is, yeah. the will to win. Uh, you know, it's, it's different these days, you know. It's, it's with all the NLI stuff, you know, um, it's, it's crazy how kids are just, and, and God bless them. You know, coaches can do that. They can leave schools without getting penalized to make money. I'm glad they're allowing the kids to do that now. So I guess the moral of the story is, do you mow lawns? No, we, 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 we don't have a lawn. Anymore. You don't have a lawn. 
We, uh, we got a 110 pound golden retriever. Our, our, our backyard drops off into the next neighborhood. Yeah. So we have a small patch of grass. <laughs> oh, that's nice. In hindsight, we probably should have got a, a, a house with a backyard. You have you have New York City wall, which is good. But no, it's the interior interior design. The, the interesting part of that to go back to that, and that's why I asked your wife that is off camera here if you if he gets some of the decision making. I had none of the decision making in my home. If I flipped a pillow to the design, it got flipped the other way. Couldn't put anything on the wall, couldn't bring any of the pillows, nothing that I had downstairs, and we got divorced years ago. So that's, I'll tell you that. Like, I, you gotta have some type of interior design. For you know, me. What's really cool is, is Jen does a lot of traveling with the kids, and she'll send me some pictures, and there's a cool app, kiosk app, and you can get these things printed right at Walmart. There's a plug for Walmart. You should get a couple bucks for those guys. Yeah. <clears throat> Say it two more times. Walmart. <laughs> and uh, so, so you go to pick up your pictures at Walmart, and um, you have them before the kids are even home. So I think that's one thing I've tried to do is, is kind of load the, you know, it's, believe it or not, I took down all the old Syracuse pictures and we started putting up all the pictures of the kids. So, yeah, yeah it's very cool. TJ, knowing that, you know, you come from a family, obviously, where your, your older brother's out there playing, and your dad has played and coached in this world. Did you ever feel the weight of that? Or has it always been kind of your own individual destiny? Yeah, I think it's always been mine. Uh, like I said earlier, my dad's never pushed me to do something I don't want to do. So if, I'm, if I wasn't feeling football, he'd, he'd say, go do something else. Like that. He'd always say, give it 100%. Though. Were, when you look at being a two-sport athlete, and you look at lacrosse and football, obviously you're going to records for lacrosse, but where does football lie with you? And is there a part of you that really did want to continue that college or did you kind of just say goodbye to that? How do you, because I mean, you got two yeah. sports, you sure you love them both. Yeah. So where does football lie? Yeah, so football is actually my first love. Um, and then during the recruiting process, it kind of happened September 1st. And that's prime football season, so that was kind of a weird situation for me. I was kind of like, I don't really want to talk to any lacrosse schools. I just want to play football. And um, and then I got into the into the winter, and uh, I was kind of like, am I getting my settling for Rutgers? And then nothing really came with football. And um, and then I got down to the campus, got down to Rutgers, and really appreciated and figured out I wasn't settling. Danny, you play the game, you coach the game. Sure. You know, and this is the hard part for me. Somebody asked me about loving football, and I said, "They said, what are your like? What are your thoughts on it?" And I finally got to publicly say what I've been thinking for a really long time, because I have built these friendships like with your dad. I love what football has done to build the bridge to people that I enjoy being around. My feeling with football, it's it's a tough road because I love the game and I love the people I know through the game. Yeah. But at the same time, what the game has done physically, mentally to some people, the hard thing for me is that I love the game itself, but I can't imagine a world where Danny doesn't know my name. I can't imagine a world, world where Rob Drummond could forget what he was talking about in the middle of a sentence, you know, and and I said that finally out loud. It was like, I love football and I love all these people. And football has given me so many great friends. And at the same time, it, it does take away. So, Danny, your your thoughts on that? And then TJ, I'd love to give you two. Yeah, this is, uh, that's number 20 right there. Yeah. So that's my 20th surgery. Uh, knee replacement, three ACLs, three rotator cuffs, reverse replacement. This one's got to get replaced. Um, you know, I, you know, everything I have in life, I owe it to football. You know, and and I, uh, you know, I, I never push my sons into football because, to be honest with you, I'm not a fan of Pop Warner football. I mean, I get it, and all my kids have played it. Um, you know. My 12-year-old over there, he's like, Dad, can I play pop water football? And I was like, yeah, it's hard to tell your kids no, you know, especially because what we have is because my wife and I met at Syracuse, you know, so um, 
it's given me a lot, but football changes. Football's not like backyard football, flag football fun, you play with your buddies. It's hard. You know, lining up against uh, uh, Gary McCummings or John Flannery and, and, and then, you know, an Al Wooten and coming downhill and just ringing bells. I mean, you know, I, I think eventually you would have thought, like, Coach P would have realized that Al Wooten and Dan Conley would have known how to hit each other on an isolation play. We'd leave and our shoulders would be hanging. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a very violent game. And, and, and then, then you add all the concussions and the neck injuries. I really, really pushed my kids to other sports like lacrosse and basketball. And, and, I, and I really don't think kids need to be introduced to tackle football until they're well into their middle school ages, you know, when they're 12, 13 years old. And, and then at that point, again, it's, it's, it's a collision game. It's not a contact game. You know, you've got to have the proper training to coach the foundation of football. You can't have Dan Tatora, who likes football, coming out here and coaching a kid and telling, you know, and having a two-on tackle, which is, was it really, is it really a, a realistic drill without somebody blocking them? Like, I remember Don Gary sliding up our first and second team tailbacks because we did the Oklahoma drill and nobody was blocking the safety. He had a free run at the tailback. Like, almost killed two kids. So, you know, football, uh, you know, um, you know, it is what it is, but uh, it's it's become a very, you know, but people are just getting bigger and stronger and faster. It's, it's a dangerous game. And, you know, I, um, it, I, it just, it's not fun. The fun part is me lining up and kicking your head in on a Saturday and then running across the field. Like Casey Jones from Miami, like he and I, you talk about a battle. Like he and I just fought the hell out of each other all game. Win or lose, we lost 16 to 10 in 1992. I go running across the field and I gave him the biggest hug, and I'm like, man, you're like one of the best guys I ever played against. Like that, the camaraderie, not only with your own teammates, but with the people you play against. And, you know, and I, you know, I took Nate, Nate went to the, the Paul McCartney concert last, last Saturday, I think it was, and I said, hey buddy, you see all these stands that are filled like this? And I said, when I was playing football here, it used to be like that. I said, except when we played Rutgers and Temple, that top corner, we wouldn't get 50,000, we get 48,000. But that's what it was like. He's like, nah. I go, yeah, it was. So those are the glory days back in the days. But you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough sport. You know, and I think coaches are smarter these days of how they practice. But at the end of the day, I mean, I'm going to my, I've had, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be going to my 21st orthopedic surgery now. I'm friends with Brian Bosworth, the Bos from Oklahoma, yeah. and so he and I were texting a year ago, and I said, here's a, I, I had a picture. And like a PDF, you know, stick figure that I made of myself that accounted for every injury. And I said, here's a picture of my 18 surgeries. He said, 18, you're a spring chicken, I'm going on 33. So it's, uh, you know, that's, that's what I don't look forward to for my kids, you know. But at the end of the day, they're, you know, I think they, I, I've overseen their coaching to, you know, you know, instead of running a sweep play and cutting it back to the backside corner, he may bust it to the sidelines and get 14 or 15 yards. So, you know, he's, he's, he's very smart when it comes to playing football. And, uh, you know, the game of lacrosse, you know, my son got knocked unconscious at Hofstra. You know, so it's a, it's a physical sport as well. So, but not as much. And I think throwing a ball, I can't do it, but I think throwing a lacrosse ball around has got to be kind of fun. You know, like shooting hoops and stuff like that. But, Put your hand in the ground and banging heads every day with, you know, Gino uh, with uh, Malgeri and, and Ty Dixie. Like I wouldn't want to do that anymore. I mean, that's just a headache all day. So, you know, that's just my that's my two cents as a 51 year old guy that's going on surgery number 21. But believe it or not, I'm like, I'm probably relatively pretty healthy. You know, I mean, went to the NFL Combine with six documented concussions, probably more like 60, but. Knock on wood, I don't know, I'm, I'm still, still hanging, I still hit a 300 yard drive today. So it, it was well into the woods, but it went 300 yards. <laughs> so TJ, I mean, you, you, you know this story of your dad, and we're here at the Wildcat Sportsbook Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora every single month here at the Wildcat on 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York. Make sure you come out here seven days a week, indoor and outdoor seating. Obviously the outdoor with our beautiful weather that we have at this time of year. And of course for takeout and delivery, 315-487-2222. We're here with the Conleys, and I said on ABC there's a show called The Conners, and I can sit on the couch with the Conleys, which is pretty fun. 
you know what your dad's been through. And he's talked to you about it. And we, you know, he just gave us, you know, obviously a rundown of what's happened here as, as he goes towards surgery 21. Did that deter you as much as you said football is your first love, knowing what can happen and knowing what your dad's been through? Did that make you pause a little bit and say, hey, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I want to have 20 surgeries? Um, no, I mean, it's always been in the back of my head, but I've uh, been surrounded by great coaches and been taught the game the right way. And um, I do think I'm like, make smart decisions on the field. So um, it's always been in the back of my head, but it's never something that's stupid. Really You're a running back. Bring me into your favorite pieces of being in the backfield because I got asked what my favorite position is in football, and you can find love for them all but I've always just loved the art of being a running back and everything that you have to do just to get three yards. So what are your favorite parts of being a running back? Um, so probably pre-snap, you can kind of see, we had, to, we had one play that's hard that, that, that just kept working, uh, a little weak side play, and you can just see every time it was a touchdown. So I get a little butt butterflies. R -Y so you can see it ahead of it? I can see it ahead. Can you, have you gone up against a team where they were doing things defensively that were hard for you to read, or do you feel like you've been, you're able to read defenses well enough to know that they can't really outsmart you? Um, it's kind of just a couple guys. I mean, I kind of just look at the backers, let the O-line deal with the D-line. Um, our coaches spend a lot of time with us in the film and let us know what we're going to see, how they played us in the past. Um, and then one of my other favorite parts would probably be if you break one, the stands, the stands screaming. It's just a, just a roar. You know, you know you're free. Do you have a favorite moment at FM on the football field? Probably my first touchdown last year against Carthage. Okay, bring us into paint the picture. Um, okay, so we got scored on the first play of the game off the kickoff, and we were kind of like, oh, that's how it's going to go. So then stalled on the first two drives, and then we get one. Um, probably, probably made the wrong read. I bounced it outside and made a few kids miss, and tiptoed the sidelines and heard this standard door and I knew I was, I knew I was free. You said you probably went the wrong, like did the wrong thing. Did did coach, was that one of the conversations where coach says, hey, you didn't do what you were supposed to do, but but you scored? Do you ever, I mean, do you get that from the coach? Sometimes, sometimes a coach will go, what do you do? And then you score and they'll go, oh, okay. And then some coaches want to pull you aside and go, don't ever do that again, despite the fact that you scored. So did coach say anything? No, my coach is agree. They, they trust me in my decision making, so it ended up working out. Favorite running back of all time? Oh, man. Uh, LaDainian Tomlinson. LaDainian Tomlinson, why? Um, can I switch that? Yeah, you can switch it. Love me on Bell. I love that. LaDainian Tomlinson, why? Leave me on Bell. <laughs> so why my Derek Henry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, why leave me on Bell? No, leave me on Bell. It was his running, which was just so unique. He'd sit behind the line of screen for three extra seconds and the ball. I will tell you something though, Le'Veon's swan song with the Steelers, my Jaguars in that divisional round, that when he decided not to come to practice that week or whatever for one or two of them, that was a game that Jacksonville won. So last time that I went to a Steelers game, I'm, and I'm, I'm leery of going back there if Jacksonville plays them again there, because that was in route to almost making the Super Bowl. So it was a good moment, but Le'Veon Bell obviously has some very proud moments. You said Derrick Henry. <coughs> I am. Um, you, you remember Darrell Smith, number 25, putting yeah. a linebacker. So Doug Hogue <clears throat> played several years in the NFL, and then uh, Darrell played a year, maybe on a, on a scout team, and you know, it, you know, basically extended his football career as far as he could. And uh, when he came back that following year in the fall camp, <clears throat> I, you know, he sat in my office, and I said, "Tell me something I never experienced, buddy." I said, "What's the NFL like?" And he's like. Everybody's good, but the difference between the great players and the good players, it's like night and day. He's like, coach, <clears throat> everybody's good. But then there's guys like Derrick Henry, they're in another world. And like, you don't even get near them in practice. You'll get, you'll get fired. He said, coach, if you touch these guys, they'll fire you right there. They'll, they'll just cut you from the team. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, that was, I just, I, I admire, you know, back in the day for, for, for a minute, Christian Okoye, these big running backs that just run, you know, Steve Atler, At, Atwater that has the courage to come up and stick a guy that's 250 pounds, but 
Derrick Henry's just such a beast, you know. Um, and I'm not, I, and I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of watching football. I'd rather go out and hang out with the kids and go play golf. I do love college football. I'm not a huge pro football fan. I'm, I'm getting into it because the kids like it, you know, and house it with the Bills. So we go to some of the Bills games. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it's a good time to be a Bills fan. Yeah. You know, and then uh, you know the quarterback. You know, and, and so anyways, it's just it's it's fun. It's fun, you know, stepping back and. I'm just learning how to become a fan, which is odd because I've either played or coached. And um, so, you know, le you know, putting some effort into being a fan, even root for the basketball team, like when they lose, it's like, oh, I feel bad and so Like, I hate feeling like that, but learning how to be a fan. TJ, I know you're going to play lacrosse, but after high school, are you ready to be a football fan? Are you ready to be done? Do you, do you feel like you might get an itch again? Uh, I'll definitely get the itch. It's okay. definitely going to be a good play football in the first fall. So. Uh, <laughs> You're going to a conference that loves to hit. You're going to the Big Ten, so being at Rutgers, not only do you get to play the sport that you also love in lacrosse, but you get to experience the Big Ten and what that is and the trenches of the Big Ten and those big bodies and those burly guys and running the ball and that ground and pound and trying to outsmart you in a 24-20 game. There's a lot of good that can come from being there. So you see that side of it and then you see the lacrosse side of it. We know the Big Ten power football. How would you describe the Big Ten lacrosse? Um, I think it's coming up. Everyone's known the Ivies and the ACC as the big two powerhouses, but we got Ohio State, Rutgers, and uh, Maryland actually just won the championship. So those, those were three teams right there that all made the tournament. Uh, Penn State was number one a couple years ago, so it's still coming up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, Old Sandusky was uh, at my kitchen table. And so was, I'm from Pittsburgh, so what kid didn't want to go to Penn State? Linebacker, you. My sister went to Penn State on a track scholarship. Sandusky sitting at the table, you know, and, and Joe Paterno, you know, and uh, for me, that part of it was just, um, it was a laid off, or, you know, so that's why I ended up going to Syracuse, but yeah, you know, the Big Ten football-wise is one of those, you know, Ohio State, Penn State, I mean, they're, they're every year they're in the top 10, 15, you know, so yeah. the, the lacrosse part of it is just, 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 you know, back, I mean, there's more parity in college lacrosse than there's ever been. I mean, there's schools out, I mean, USC's getting a lacrosse team, uh, Florida's getting a lacrosse team for men. You know, they're turning club teams into like collegiate teams. And, you know, it's no longer just Hopkins, Maryland, Syracuse, and whoever else, you know, Princeton. It's just, there's so many more opportunities for young guys now. And, you know, it's a conversation that TJ and I have, being able to, jump on a plane and go play Big Ten lacrosse, and, and not only that, but experience big time college athletic programs on, a, on, a, on an academic scale, on an athletic scale, socially, so just very cool. We're very, you know, the whole family's excited for him, and you know, I do think that my older son's gonna end up playing with him for a year or two, and you know, I mean, it's gonna be great, so. What do you, what do you think about that? That you could sit, you could be playing with your older brother yeah. on the same team in college. Yeah, it'd be sweet. Uh, I didn't get to play with him because COVID in freshman year, senior year, so yeah, it, that, that could be pretty cool. I, he told me he's like, he's, he's all good. It, it, it all works out. He's an absolute. So where is where is he at with that right now? Uh, he's in there. Right, he's in the portal right now. Um, they, he's sent a transfer out to school, so he just went for space to get back to him. Is that the is that is this like a real, tangible, do you think, like, more so this is going to happen than not going to happen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if it's going to happen or not, but... But you're okay with it? I'm definitely okay with it. So do you feel like, I mean, like you said, because of COVID, you didn't get the opportunity to play together, so obviously it's his decision, but if you got that opportunity, would that somehow, you know, kind of right or wrong that you guys didn't have control over? Um, no, I don't know. No. So, is there a team going to play for Rutgers? Is there a team in the Big Ten that you've already kind of circled that you would love to go up against right now if you can? Yeah, you have to pass the best. 
and Maryland has had that relevancy and that leadership of the Big Ten. So what is it about their game and what they do that gets you excited to challenge it? Because if you want to be the best, you got to go through them, right? So what is it about Maryland that you're excited to be challenged by on yeah. the field? Um, they, they recruit the best kids in the country. Um, probably got one of the best coaches in the country, and they've been good for a while. So it's, it's like Alabama with football. You're playing, you're playing against the best guys in practice, so you're only going to get better. When you're making this decision at Rutgers, how much of it had to do with the conference they were in and the level of competition that you know you're going to have every season within that conference? Did the Big Ten play a role in this when you were looking at Rutgers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, why, why wouldn't you want to go play on one of the biggest conferences in the country? So um, it was definitely a talk I had with my brothers. Like, dude, you're going to go play like, Big Ten cross. Like, you kind of dream of that when you're fiddling with your little mini stick in the backyard. So um, it's, it's definitely pretty cool to kind of see a dream come true. Did you see this always for yourself when you were when you were in the backyard, like you said, just playing with that stick and trying to emulate maybe one of your favorite players? Did you see back then that this could be a reality, or have you somehow maybe surprised yourself at times? I mean, was this always something you thought you could do, or somewhere along the line did you realize, hey, this could be a reality? Um, I've, I've always felt from when I was younger, I, I thought I could do it. Um, just playing on the back step, I mean, I, I love, I, I want to get better. So it's like, it's, it's not an issue. I'm, oh, I got to go, go work out, I got to go shoot or something. So it, it, I enjoy it. Um, I, know, I know I put the time and effort in it, so it's kind of a relief to see it come. Yeah. But um, it definitely wasn't a surprise. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll rewind maybe 10 years. Um, nine years, we were uh, playing in the kickoff classic, and we had a bunch of little poker pickers, I call them, and a couple of good players on our team. And TJ was TJ has been very good at everything he's done athletically since he stepped on the field. So there was another good little player that played over at Baldwinsville, and we had video. So it's JJ Starling running down the sideline, and TJ's chasing him, and probably just on his tail hip. Uh, two of the better athletes in central New York. This was nine years ago. And uh, we, it's, it's, on, it's on Facebook, and um, it, it pops up every once in a while. This was eight years ago, and it's J.J. Starlin and T.J. playing against each other. So for you, there's God-given talent, right? There's genes, there's something that comes from a higher power. But then there's work ethic. Why do you have that? Why, like you said, you're like, I never thought, you just said it, like, I was never like, oh, I gotta go left, I gotta go shoot. What is it about you, besides that raw talent that you have, the stuff that you had to command out of yourself, why do you have the work ethic that you have? Why are you so in love with this game? Um, probably it's just like, if my parents have always told me, if you want to be great, you gotta work for it, so it's like, I know, I want to go, I mean, I, to me, college class is still a pinnacle. It's like the top. Um, so if you want to you want to make it to the top league, you got to put in the work. And with my dreams to play in one of the top three conferences in college across, I got to put in the work. So I fell in love with putting in the work. Rutgers, right now, where do you feel like they're at as far as describing their lacrosse team? And what are you most excited about from what you have seen from that? Yeah, so they have 25 or 20 something seniors, so they're graduating a lot of guys, which leaves room for young guys to step in. I think I fit in most with their style of play. They run a gun, they like to get up and down. I, I like to use my athleticism to get up and down, get uh, five on four goals or four on three goals. Play uh, like not regular, I mean, regular across, I guess. Yeah. There's a. Our, our mutual buddy over at Baldwinsville, Matt uh, Wilcox, yeah. made a comment about TJ, which was, was very kind. Uh, but he said, nobody gets downhill like TJ Connolly in this area. And I, I've never heard that analogy used in lacrosse, like getting downhill for a running back or getting downhill as a linebacker. I get that. I, I used to watch him, and I'd watch you know, some of his teammates or even some of the kids he would play against, and they'd they play against a good defender. And 
you know, as they start to get downhill, they start to get wide now. And TJ is a guy that, A, can be a kid with speed, but one, if he is playing against a good defensive player, that hard work he's put in, it, it really just becomes part of your life. You know, that, that was the same thing for me growing up. It was never like, oh, I have to lift. It was like, it's just a part of everyday life. Like, everyday life is, you know, getting up, going to school, lifting weights. Like, what do I do after that? You know, what is there to do after that? So, but being able to watch him actually get downhill, be explosive with speed, but then have the strength to lean in and lever back towards the goal with the strength that he's developed has just made him that much better than the cross player. So uh, Matt Wilcox was, was very kind in his comments, but yeah, yeah that was that was really awesome. And I know he sent me over something. I wanted to read what he said here. So I'm sure we've already shared it. I don't know if your dad shared it with you, but he had made a comment here. Let's see where it is. Let's see. Am I too hot? Am I giving the feedback here, Dana? <laughs> no, you're good. But uh, so yeah, no. What what he said here is you had said a really nice thing to him. He said, "I remember him being such a great player." Speaking on you for Q's football, and then please tell him I said thanks for the kind words again. It means a lot coming from you because you had said that you can't thank him enough for everything that he said about TJ and all of those words that you had just mentioned here. And then they go on and they win a state championship. So what does it mean for you that one of the coaches here in the area in section three, Matt Wilcox at Beville, that he saw something good in you enough to publicly speak about it, share it with you and, and reach out? I mean, it's not always easy for a coach to say, hey, that guy on the other team is really good. So what does it mean to you that, you know, Coach Wilcox had so many nice things to say? Yeah, uh, it means a lot. I mean, definitely didn't have to say those words, but it means a lot coming from a guy who's not my coach. So. so, favorite moment before we jump into rapid fire, favorite moment thus far at FM when it comes to lacrosse? Uh, we beat Scan in a messy game, 11 10 in overtime, and I had an assist to Luis Coyandro. It's like a signature play, I just hit a best. That's your favorite? Right now. Right now, yeah. So, where do we go from here with FM? Um, struggled this year, um, so you can only build on it. Um, hopefully, we get the section of the title next year. So, for you, to look at that and, and, like you said, have a hope for a sectional title, how much of that do you feel the weight of on your shoulders? Um, I feel like it's kind of different because you got to have the, all the other guys pull along. So it's, it's more, I think it's more fun to play across. I feel like everyone plays the best when they're just having fun. Yeah. Playing free. Um, but it definitely comes with being with the guys over the summer and not practicing full go, but shooting around and being on the wall. You know what it's like to get to a championship game. What are those little, tiny pieces that can change it all? Uh, probably the chemistry. Chemistry, we had my sophomore year, so we won section with my sophomore year. Yeah. Um, and we had our whole starting lineup was a bunch of seniors who have played together since they were in fifth grade. So we hopefully have that coming up this year, and hopefully we can just play that. Knowing that you've committed to Rutgers, now that that's done, do you feel like that weight off and now, did you want to do it at this point so you could just play free, have one more ride with FM and not have to think about it? Was this the plan? Yeah, definitely. Definitely commit early and have the weight off your shoulders of not having a, oh, I didn't score this many goals or this coach didn't see me play this well. Or, so this summer I'm just excited to go out there and have fun. And so you're a thousand percent Rutgers. Like if this season you get 10 phone calls, what do you do with all that? If somebody says, hey, wait, 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 like we just want to talk to you for five minutes. How do you handle that? Yeah, it's actually happened a couple times with some football schools. So I just tell them, hey, I'm going to get So you have that done. You have one more ride. You have this last opportunity. Being with the guys one more time at FM, that to you, like you said, you want sectionals. But you know what it's like to have the game taken away from you. You know what it's like to go through a pandemic. You've been through a lot as a young person in this world. 
What do you appreciate more so now about lacrosse and just school in general that maybe you didn't before when the world didn't stop? Yeah, so it's weird that you're saying one else, right? Because I don't think that's ever going to end. So now I, I got one more day of school left and now I'm a big kid in the school. It's kind of weird. And, yeah. So it's, it takes a good use to, but definitely not taking anything for granted. Um, losing a year, we lose losing year in academics, athletics, so not taking anything for granted. We're jumping into rapid fire. Danny and you, TJ, are going to be able to ask me questions. You get two apiece, I get two. Could have to do with sports or nothing to do with sports. It's free reign here. Wildcat Sports Pub as we are here on site on location with Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. We're here every single month at the Wildcat Sports Pub and always proud to be here with you for over five years now right here on this stage and before the stage is built in the main room as well. So Danny Conley, TJ Conley, myself, Dan Tortora in this trio. We jump into rapid fire here at the Wildcat and TJ, I'm going to let you ask me the first question. All right, uh, favorite high school memory? <sighs> Favorite high school memory? Well, so I went to Christian Brothers Academy, and I can tell you that my class wasn't that close. And I'm not a click guy. I talk to everybody. That's just me. I was raised that, like, everybody matters, so you should be nice to people because you'd want them to be nice to you. So I didn't really fit our grade. The class ahead of us, tight. Us. 127 people going in different directions. But, so I will tell you my favorite memory, one of my favorite memories is one that I never thought I would have. So I've been singing my whole life. And so I, I sang the talent show that year. And I don't know, just, I knew what I wanted to do. I, I knew, you know, I, I believe in myself, believe in my voice. And I just kind of did things that meant a lot to me. And despite what people thought of me, and so at the end of the year, we did awards. And you choose for every award, and some of them weren't great. Some of them was like, you know, most talkative, or person who's late all the time. You know, they weren't all great. So they're going through the awards, and there's one guy and one girl for every award. So I'm thinking I'm gonna get some like mean thing, some backhanded compliment or something ridiculous, or just not even be thought of at all. So I'm like delirious. I'm just blocking it out, we're in the auditorium. And they said, most likely to become successful. And Mr. Roach, one of my teachers that I just saw recently, shout out to, to Mr. Roach. So he reads the name off for Guy, and he says, most likely to become successful, Dan Tortora. And then they go to the other guy for the girl, and he's like, that's it. We don't have anybody. Like, everybody wrote your name. I thought they were kidding. And then everybody cheered in the room, and I was like, for real? So I guess it was that moment in realizing that I thought I had nobody there, and yet they saw something in me that maybe they didn't tell me until the end. And, you know, I appreciated that, because I didn't expect it. So I'll call that a memory. I'm gonna ask you one now. So, TJ, let's stick with that. Do you have a favorite high school memory outside of sports? Oh, outside of sports. Um... It's like everything comes back to sports. Um, yeah, so I went over. We had like there's this pig roast, and um, okay. so I, it's like all the adults and everyone's surrounding the pig because they all think it's the like, coolest stuff ever. And um, I got offered to eat a pig's eye, and I rarely eat like future vegetables. Anyway. So everyone's like, "There's no way you're gonna do it," and. I did it, I ate the pig's eye, so I saw the big joke of some pig with friends. Did you eat the pig's eye? I ate the pig's eye. I will tell you, I ate two fish eyes, and I'm not kidding with you, I feel like I went through space and time and like jumped into another universe. Something in my brain felt strange after I had those, those eyes. I'm like, for like eight minutes, I feel like I could see through time, and you know, then it was status quo after that. But it was a very weird thing to, be dared yeah. to eat fish eyes, and I did, and they tasted very strange. Danny, what's your first one for me? For you? Yeah. 
How many pairs of shoes do you have, sneaker-wise? Sneaker-wise. My sneaker game's in a better place than it's ever been. I, was, I could tell. So I have, I have I these. Sure if you're a sock guy yeah. or a sneaker guy. So I have these both. videos. I'm both. I actually have. You know what? I put on these today hoping somebody would ask me. I'm a big Marvel fan, so I'll show the screen that. Those are my Venom socks. But I, uh, yeah, I, I never thought I'd do anything other than white socks. Because I was, again, like, I didn't, I was like, oh, I don't want people to make fun of me, whatever. And I'm like, I am who I am. So at 36 years old, my socks are Marvel, Toronto Raptors, everything. So I love these. And my sneakers, how many pairs do I have now? I would say I have, I have ones that look like Venom in Syracuse, and I have orange ones, so one, two, I have mellows. Probably six pairs now or seven, but there's like two that I wear all the time. So these are from my mom. She, they were giving me for Christmas. And then my dad got me, I called my wake-up call sneaks because my, my colors for wake-up call are black, white, gray, and orange, and that's the color of them. So it's, uh, yeah, I would say those are probably my two favorites. And then I also have like my running or jogging shoes that have like a, like a liquid look to it, like a venom, so it's kind of cool. Never been asked that question before. All right, Danny, so we've talked about a lot of things over the years. Yeah. I want to talk with you about food. Yeah. Okay? It's a two-part question. Well, okay. If you could only have one breakfast, one dinner, and one lunch for the rest of your life, you need to pick a meal for each. And you can have more than one thing at the meal. Yep. But breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, and then the B part of this question is, what is your favorite thing that your wife makes? Uh... So I'll go reverse. My favorite food my wife makes is a chicken chili on Sundays for NFL football. I was gonna have chili on Sunday. Chicken uh, chili, though, I like that. Chicken chili. It's uh, with like kind of like a red salsa sauce, something like that. Um, believe it or not, the older I get, the less interested I am in food. I'm kind of a okay. yogurt peanut butter guy in the morning. I had a uh, uh, really, I had a horseradish roast beef sandwich for lunch, and. Uh, my boys turned me on to this chicken Chick Fil A sauce. Yeah, for, uh, white ball. Yeah, um, and I saw so chicken tenders that. and that sauce. So very basic. <laughs> you go, man. So ch shout out to Johnny Fordyce, one of the great workers here at the Wildcat. So and a Cincinnati Bengal fan. You said Chick Fil A for dinner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. The, the sauce actually. The I, sauce. I'll, I'll okay. get like Tops or Wegmans chicken tenders, heat them up, and you just love the Chick Fil A sauce. I like this Chick Fil A sauce. All right, well, shout out to Jimmer Sikowski. We proudly work with Chick-fil-A sister on Chick-fil-A fight. I'm a Polynesian sauce guy. What's your last one for me, TJ? Um, favorite band. Favorite band? That's a good question. Favorite band? Oh, boy. Journey? Probably Journey. Yeah. I'd probably say Journey without doubt because for whatever reason, a couple days ago, I was getting out of the shower and Faithfully was in my head. And, so that was, I was rocking with Faithfully for a while. So that, that was right before church, Faithfully. But yeah, no, probably Journey. I've seen them a couple times, and and uh, big fan of Arnell Pineda, big fan of Steve Perry. They're a really awesome group. Yeah, they're really good. All right, TJ, let's stick with music. You can play three songs in your car for the rest of your life. Which ones and why? Do you have a favorite singer, band, uh, anything? Favorite band, I'll just go, there's probably three off the top of my head, Two Fighters, 30 Seconds to Mars, and uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Okay, have you had to pick one of those three for the rest of your life? Red Hot Chili Peppers. That's what I thought you'd say. Do you have a favorite Red Hot Chili Peppers song? Snow. Snow? Yeah. Okay, all right, fair enough. Danny, what's your last one for me? What's your favorite cover song to sing? Oh, that's, that's nice. That's hard. Oh, boy. Bravo. You know, it's funny because my mom also sings, and we were talking about music, and she was trying to think of some songs that could come top of mind that, that are good to, to cover. And I was just thinking about this. 
I would probably, you know what, this is unique, but I test my voice a lot with this because I like the classic rock side of things. Rents, are the, the musical Rent that I never saw on Broadway, they're original singers. There's, song, there's a song called One Song Glory, and there's a song called I'll Cover You, the reprise of that. And both of those songs are, as my mom said it, she said, the more you give yourself to a song, and the more emotion, the deeper you go into it, the better you sound. And those songs get me to tears. So I'd probably say the Rent songs. Those are probably my cover ones. Really good songs. And re reminiscent of like Bon Jovi in the way that they kind of go about it. I'll tell you, there's a, uh, my wife and I, son had a, a really cool moment during the Paul McCartney concert where he sang a duet with John Lennon. They took his voice when he was singing on top of the building and overlaid it, and Paul McCartney sang with him. Yeah, that's a really cool. dope moment. And then there was a cool moment down in Philly back in 2012. Roger Waters sang a duet with himself from 1970-something at Earl Stadium and uh, for Mother. It was a younger version of Roger and an older version of Roger. Yeah, really cool. It's, it's cool how they will take pieces of that and kind of put them together. And there's people that have done like a like a hologram of Michael Jackson and, and have that moment. And it's interesting because if I could sit in a studio, there was a there's a short list of people I'd always love to sit in a studio with. One of them is Phil Collins and also James Taylor. But Luther Vandross, if he was alive, I would have loved to do that. My mom loves the song Dance of My Father. But... James Taylor to me, when you said like old singing with the new, it would be really cool to see James Taylor sing with James Taylor because of the long history he's had in Carol King and all that. So my question for you, Danny. What advice would you give to the high school version of yourself if you could go back? Stay the course. I, I want to trade anyway. I'm very blessed. I like that. I like that. So we put a little more effort in academics. <laughs> but I did graduate from Syracuse and almost got my master's. But yeah, I wouldn't change anything. I got a great family, a great wife, three great kids, and they're all healthy. And I work for great people and got good buddies like you. So I wouldn't change anything. And I do want to give a shout out and. I'm going to let you take it for mom. And well, I'm going to let you both take it for mom and your younger brother over here. So, TJ, best thing about mom? Um, it's too many. There it is. Uh, her support. Her support? support. Danny, best thing about your wife? Um, just, we've been together married for 20 years we dated in college just uh, a level uh, just a love i never thought i'd find you know that that commitment that sincerity that you know that as a new a newly done fiance what advice do you have for me on what makes a marriage work trust I like that. very heartfelt moment so tell me something about the youngling here, Danny, I'll start with you. Let's shout out your, your uh, young So, one. Nate's 12, he's 5'9", 150 pounds, and uh, you're what, 5'8"? Oh, your weight, he's 145. <laughs> um, he's a big dude. Yeah. Um, he could be better than, than his two older brothers. Uh, he's just found some swag, and he is playing really the best athlete, uh, best He's, he's just shiny right now, so, and he's a long defensive player, so, you know, TJ, I think the coolest part is, if, if my wife and I have done anything right, besides treat each other right, is uh, we've raised three kids that care about their brother, and so now, you know, they're, the older kids are now bringing the 12-year-old up to high school, and, and he's a defensive player, and now he's starting to play against TJ, and they're bringing each other along, so it's just, we're very blessed. TJ, you shook your head when Dad said that Nate could be the, better than you and Zach. So what would you say about your brother? Um, 
kind word for Nate, who, who slow clapped himself. Yeah. I did see. I mean, I'm, I'm just excited for this summer, be able to get him in the, in the workout room and be able to take him out to the turf and stuff. I mean, not everything revolves around sports, so hopefully build some some off the field moments. But um, definitely excited for his future. Well, to the Conley trio of boys, and to you, Danny, and your wonderful wife, I appreciate the fact that you guys have spent some time with me here today. In 18 plus years of being a broadcaster, I have talked to coaches who have their son on their team, but I have never done a show that is just sitting on a couch with a father and a son. So we've made history here today. Over 3,000 guests on the show, and I've never done this. So TJ, thank you. Danny, thank you. Thanks, Danny. And it means a lot to me that this can hopefully, more than anything else, be a time capsule for you guys. But you know that you're always welcome, just like your father on the show, and your brother, brother Nate knows. So tell your older bro, but TJ, thank you for everything. Danny, as always, appreciate it. Shout out to Dan and Wildcats for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to Danny, thank you to Heather Tome, and thank you to everybody here. Nikki at the bar and every single person. Johnny, I already shouted out, and Shane and company and Zach. And so thank you to everybody that is here at the Wildcat. You can come here seven days a week, 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus. You can hear them Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern time on my broadcast of Wake Up Call. And of course, you can come here for takeout and delivery, 315-487-2222. For now, from the Conleys to your household and for Wake Up Call with Ian Tortora. Thank you for being with us. Make sure you support local, be good to each other, stay safe, and as always, the three things I always tell people, God bless, no stress, do your best. We'll be